Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's In Conversation Live here at the Royal Society of Medicine with Peter Cardwell. My name is Henrietta Bowden-Jones. I am a trustee of the Royal Society of Medicine and president of the psychiatry section at the RSM. Before we start, I would just like to encourage you all uh, to use the Q&A function. It makes the evenings lively and you can pretty much ask Peter anything to do with uh, politics, journalism, uh, writing a book, writing his memoirs, etc. So feel inspired and do go ahead. Um, Peter, a very good evening to you. And I'm going to start by reading your biography before we get going. So Peter Cardwell, award-winning broadcaster for 10 years, public speaker, author of The Secret Life of Special Advisors. I've got it here and have loved it. A political commentator, uh, he served as a special advisor or SPAD in the UK government for three and a half years. Uh, he worked for four conservative cabinet ministers in four departments, uh, the Northern Ireland office, the Home Office, the Minister of Housing and the Minister of Justice. After being educated in Northern Ireland, he studied at St. Hughes College, Oxford, before winning a Fulbright scholarship to the Columbia School of Journalism in New York. Peter, a very warm welcome to you. And um, I'm going to uh, start tonight uh, by actually with a big bang by asking you how on earth working from home one day in your role as SPAD, uh, you managed to uh, lose a company, 387 million pounds. Do you want to tell us a story? Well, I mean, who amongst us, uh, Eric, can say that we, we haven't done that? No, um, thank you very much indeed for that very warm welcome. And uh, I feel very humbled to speak to the Royal Society of Medicine because I'm someone who scraped a uh, double B in double award science. Uh, science is, uh, uh, my, was one of my absolutely worst subjects, uh, all three of them, uh, biology, chemistry and physics, and to be in the company of so many people who have done so much for uh, to keep people well, to uh, fix them when they're not well, and to uh, keep us all healthy. I really appreciate that. And I know the NHS has done amazing work in the last 18 months, uh, but also uh, since its establishment. So thank you to everybody for that. Um, in terms of the 387 million, yeah, um, until Dominic Cummings uh, sort of banned the practice or almost banned the practice, uh, a lot of special advisors used to work from home on Friday. Friday is a strange day in politics because obviously the main week in Westminster is Monday to Thursday. And on Thursday nights, we would generally gather for a drink and uh, talk about, ask each other at a pub in Westminster, you know, have you had a, a West Wing week? Have you had a, a week where you're, you know, taking part in amazing things behind the scenes where you are uh, helping people and uh, changing the country for the better? Or have you had a sort of thick of it week where like the characters in the BBC uh, drama or documentary, uh, as, as we sometimes refer to it, um, who are sort of flapping around, uh, trying to, to put the, the, the tube back on the toothpaste after someone says something they shouldn't. So uh, I was having a very quiet uh, Friday, sitting at home in my uh, sort of jogging bottoms. And uh, it was in February 2019 when I received a phone call from uh, the policy editor, the Whitehall editor of the Times newspaper. I was a special advisor to James Brogenshire at that point. He was the housing communities and local government secretary and uh, housing was a big issue. And Oliver Wright, the journalist at the Times, asked me if I'd heard that the big um, housing company, Persimmon, was about to post profits of a billion pounds in a year. Uh, its, its profits were just coming out. I said, I hadn't heard that. And he said, you know, is there any kind of reaction to that? Do you think that's a good thing? Um, you know, what, what, what does James Brogenshire think? And if you ever read in newspaper uh, or, or online or anything that, uh, you know, a source close to another government minister is uh, has said that's usually uh, the special advisor uh, the person like me who, who said that so um we had the conversation i got a few lines together and spoke to a few people involved and um sent the uh, the quote off uh, from a source close to james brogenshire thought nothing more of it uh, got on with the rest of my day and and off i went and uh, now the next day the times newspaper's front page headline was help to buy house giant faces loss of contract. And the paragraph uh, was absolutely fine. Oliver Wright did a good job as he always does. Uh, but the first paragraph was Britain's most profitable house builder faces being stripped of its um, 
uh, sorry, Estrebo was right to sell help to buy homes after allegations of poor standards and hidden punitive charges. James Brokenshire, the Housing Secretary, is reviewing Persimmon's participation in the government scheme, and then so on, and then the quote from me and all the rest of it. Um, and that was all fine, and the sort of Saturday was busy, but not too busy, a few journalists sort of um, following it up and so on. And then came the following Monday morning when the markets opened, and uh, the story was basically built around my, my text to, to Oliver Wright. And uh, over the course of that day on the stock market, um, Persimmon uh, had a 4.9% drop in the value of its uh, share, uh, its market capitalization. So um, company, I basically lost the company 387 million pounds in one day. Uh, so that was uh, just one of the things you can do when you're a special advisor, probably not a thing to do every day, and the good news for um, the capitalists amongst you is that um, Persimmon recovered. Uh, it was okay, uh, but uh, certainly for a while, I was sort of thinking, have I done the wrong thing? And you kind of don't realize uh, all the time that your words can have consequences. And of course, I suppose, having worked with James Brogan previously in uh, the Northern Ireland office, where I was a special advisor as well, um, I knew that you know in Northern Ireland, words matter all the time. Sometimes people quite literally go out of their way to be offended. In Northern Ireland, um, so that was uh, that was a, a, an interesting lesson. But I didn't do anything wrong. Nobody did anything wrong. The Times didn't do anything wrong. But uh, sometimes you just don't think when you're sitting in your jogging bottoms uh, with a cat on your lap uh, and bashing away at your laptop with your phones going that these things will uh, necessarily happen to you. A brilliant way to start to start the book. Um, so so tell us a little bit. Some people, most people, maybe who are listening tonight, may not exactly know even for how long special advisors have been around. Or you, you did a very good introduction in terms of the history of, of SPADs. And and can you sort of contextualize a bit the sort of job that you've written about in your book? Of course, yeah. It's a funny old job because it didn't really exist uh, thirty sort of sixty years ago, and uh, it was really during the, the sort of pendulum politics of the 1960s and early 70s that special advisors uh, came to the fore and were formalized. There had always been advisors to ministers and prime ministers throughout history, especially in wartime, specialist advisors would be brought in. But in terms of simply someone that the uh, minister relies upon for uh, good advice uh, and political advice. So you have the civil service, of course, there are thousands, tens of thousands of them, and they are uh, certainly in what they do, and they're meant to be impartial at all times, most of them are. And uh, they, of course, uh, give advice to ministers, but each cabinet secretary at the moment, anyway, has at least two, sometimes up to five or six special advisors who are political advisors. I was a member of the Conservative Party, and we give uh, both media and policy advice. But certainly when they started in the sort of 1960s and early 70s, uh, the idea was that there would be very few of them, uh, that they would be uh, around as an addition to the civil service, as they still are, and would advise mostly the prime minister. And indeed, uh, the numbers of special advisors have waxed and waned uh, over the years. Margaret Thatcher had very few, for example, whereas uh, David Cameron had quite a lot, and uh, Boris Johnson has quite a lot as well, over 100. In fact, Boris Johnson has about 120 special advisors at the moment. And people say, you know, they're overpaid, they're, they're completely... Uh, you know, they have no accountability and all the rest of it. Um, the thing with a special advisor is that you are a political mayfly. Uh, you usually last on average about two years. I had three and a half and was very lucky to survive a number of reshuffles and moving around and people being sacked and resigning and all the rest of it. Uh, my original boss, James Brogenshire, whose name has been in the media recently because he very sadly died two weeks ago tomorrow. Uh, his funeral, in fact, is tomorrow. Uh, and uh, he was he recruited me originally for the Northern Ireland office and I worked with him twice. In fact, I was beside him almost every day of his ministerial career, of his uh, cabinet uh, ministerial career. And uh, indeed, the, the book, a lot of it is about him and about what it was like. And I think that I was listening to the tributes in Parliament today uh, from the Prime Minister and Keir Starmer and many other people, very movingly from some members of Labour, including Chris Bryant, actually, uh, who was nearly in tears. Um, it was really nice to see that, you know, we often think of politicians as ambitious, uh, very, sometimes out for themselves, on the make, um, principles free characters, and some of them are definitely, but like any group of 650 people, you know, there are good politicians and bad politicians, there are good doctors and bad doctors, good 
you know, shop assistants and bad shop assistants. And uh, I was very, very privileged. I worked with four ministers. I got on very, very well with all of them. But James uh, really properly became a friend and uh, I miss him a huge amount. And uh, I know that um, there is a great fund that we set up. If you have a set up uh, a fundraiser for the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation. And uh, I know that the uh, Royal Society of Medicine is asking for uh, some contributions for this tonight. And please, please do donate. But if you ever, if you felt that you wanted to donate to the Roy Castle uh, Lung Cancer Foundation, uh, the link is on my is on my um, Twitter feed. So apologies, Ada, for, for mentioning that. But we, we've raised over £50,000 in two weeks. And uh, that is fantastic. And in fact, uh, even more dramatic than that uh, is that uh, you'll have picked up by the visuals on screen that I'm, I'm not the fittest and healthiest 37-year-old uh, there ever has been, but I've, I've uh, perhaps foolishly signed up to run the London Marathon <laughs> next year, for so hopefully I'll lose a bit of the porch. That's a wonderful thing to hear, how, 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 how great that you have signed up for that, uh, uh, and congratulations, and it's very inspiring. Uh, we'll get on, we'll have time to speak a little bit more uh, uh, about, about James as a, as a mentor, uh, but um, please, yes, um, let's make sure that we, we have it on our uh, RSM uh, emails and, and Twitter feed, and, uh, and I'll help you with that. So Thank just you. going back to, um, just going back to, uh, now, objectively speaking, uh, now you're no longer a SPAD. Um, we know that roughly, I think there's 10, million, 10 million pounds the government spends on SPADs a year. Is it money well spent? I think it is money well spent because I think that when you're a minister, uh, especially a cabinet minister, you're in a very lonely position. There aren't very many people who understand what it's like to do that. You're usually thrust into a department that you have very little knowledge of necessarily, unless you've perhaps shadowed the department before. These jobs can be very overwhelming. And essentially what you have is not just the civil service to give you the official advice, but your special advisors are there to say, um, you know, this is what they're not telling you. These are the political implications of this. The backbenches won't be happy with this. I've spoken to someone in the uh, adjacent department. For example, when I was in the Ministry of Justice, I talked to the Home Office special advisors quite a lot because sometimes there would be battles internally in Whitehall. It's a large institution. There are, of course, many people who have uh, all sorts of turf wars, not just the politicians, but some of the, some of the uh, civil servants, especially some of the senior civil servants can be quite uh, political with a small P, not party political, but wanting to, to do sort of land grabs and things. So you're dealing with a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that shouldn't really bother the public, but it does. And I think that if you're a cabinet minister, you want someone who you can have a very, very honest and confidential uh, conversation with. There aren't that many people you can truly properly trust. And I think having even one or two people, even if they are on the public payroll, um, then that's all right. And I think that you know the number of special advisors versus the number of civil servants, for example, is tiny. I mean, you're talking about, as I said, 120 people or so at the moment versus you know, the Home Office, for example, has 32,000 civil servants. Okay, some of them are border force guards and all the rest of it, but they come under the auspices of, of, uh, of that uh, department. In the uh, Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, for example, which is now, uh, you've got the even more confusing title of the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Uh, there is a budget of something like 32 billion pounds for that department. Uh, so I think, you know, if you're Secretary of State, you, you definitely want to hear the official advice, but you also don't know, you know, is, is this civil servant telling me this because they couldn't get it through the last person and they're trying to get it through me? Is this civil servant my friend or are they being nice to me because I'm the Secretary of State or are they being nice to me because I'm a nice person? Uh, should, you know, what about the advice? What's the agenda of this person in this meeting? Uh, what happens if I say I don't want this to happen? Um, you know, civil service put a proposal in front of you, you say no, um, can you make sure that that doesn't happen? So you have enforcers who are your special advisors to make sure that happens. There's a lot of liaison that cabinet ministers really don't have time to do, even their junior ministers who may not be political allies and may be snapping up their heels and that's sometimes the case. In fact, there's one serving cabinet minister, it would be unfair to, to name this person, but their deputy the most senior, um, jun the most senior junior minister in the department, if that makes sense, um, is someone who you know is snapping at their heels and very uh, not very happy that they are not a cabinet minister, and this this other person is. And uh, the relationship between between the two of them was described to me by a, another cabinet minister actually as like Taiwan and China. They don't officially recognise one another, uh, which I thought was an, an, an excellent an excellent. Uh, Excellent. Uh, well, yeah. and in fact, the, the, the senior minister, the, the cabinet secretary, 
had uh, was going through a very tough time politically, uh, where this cabinet minister was very, very strongly criticised for something. And uh, their number two, who doesn't like them, was going around the office uh, handing out uh, the celebrations chocolates uh, to some of the uh, some of the some of the civil servants. So you know the, the people who you know you cannot rely on on your junior ministers yeah. to necessarily be your allies. So I think having one or two allies there uh, to do to uh, you know do some of the work for you to make sure what your what you say goes essentially with the with the civil service it is not a bad idea, and I think that it actually is good value for money. Um, great. We've got a question from Paul Dinsdale. Amazed to hear that Boris Johnson currently has around 120 advisers on different issues, which is not immediately apparent from his decisions. Isn't there a danger that Spads, as in the case of Dominic Cummings and his gang, can become a faction or clique, which is uh, not healthy for good government? And I was going to get on to various of the Spads in, his, in recent history that we're all familiar with, but why don't you answer that to start with? Yeah, I think it's an absolutely fair point, Paul, um, in terms of, I mean, Boris Johnson himself doesn't have 120 special advisors, so that's across the government. Uh, he himself, his staff in Downing Street and 10 Downing Street is actually, in comparison to some of the uh, departments, a very small place, there are only about 100 people who work in 10 Downing Street, about 40 of them, 40, 45 of them will be special advisors. But usually in the departments, in the 23, 24 different departments, across Whitehall, there'll be sort of one or two special advisors who will advise, uh, you know, Priti Patel or, or, or Sajid Javid or, or whomever. Um, so uh, you, in terms of Dominic Cummings, I mean, the, the thing with any special advisor is that your power derives directly from the person you work for. And they can hire and fire you at will. Um, employment law doesn't really get a look in. If uh, your minister says to you one morning at 27 minutes past nine, do you know what? I don't think this is working out. I think I, I, you want to go. I want you to go. Off you go. Um, in indeed, as a special advisor, you have two approvals. One is your Downing Street approval and one is your ministerial approval. And if either of those is revoked at any time, uh, you lose your job. And in fact, that happened to Fiona Hill, uh, who was, um, with, she and Nick Timothy were known as the terrible twins and uh, the gruesome twosome and all these sort of horrible names that were given to them, but they were the sort of chief uh, special advisors to Theresa May when she was at the Home Office. Uh, uh, Fiona leaked a letter from Michael Gove and uh, her approval from Downing Street was revoked and therefore she could not uh, continue as a special advisor. Then she uh, came back in a blaze of glory as chief of staff at Downing Street when Mrs May uh, became prime minister. In terms of Dominic Cummings, I mean, that's he's, he's a whole other conversation, um, I'm, I'm, which I'm very happy to have this evening. By yeah, the way. please, let's have it. I think a lot of us are very keen to hear a bit more about yeah. how well, powerful as, was he. As I, well, very, very is the answer. I mean, as I say in the book, um, I mean, I was in, I'd gone, for, I'd sort of served under three chiefs of staff, well, four actually. So you had Nick and Fee, uh, who were, you know, fine, very, very clear in what they wanted, which was helpful. You had Gavin Barwell, who's actually just just um, released a book called Chief of Staff, who was Chief of Staff for two years, very kind of mild-mannered, um, very approachable, very nice guy. Um, and then, you know, he left when Mrs May left and Dominic Cummings came in as not as Chief of Staff, but as the, the sort of most senior advisor. And actually, it's quite interesting that he did, decided not to take that title. So I remember being in, uh, as I said in the book, actually, I remember being in um, the pillared room of uh, Downing Street, which is where they, if you've ever, if anyone in this call has ever been to a reception at Downing Street, uh, that's sort of the main the big room. And all the special advisors were brought in for this um, slightly absurd meeting at um, 7.55 a.m. I'm not entirely sure why that, that uh, time was chosen, but 7.55 a.m. was chosen for uh, the time. And uh, we went in. And we were told, you know, if you leak, you will be marched from your desk, your, uh, you know, your phone and your laptop will be taken off you, you have no rights. Um, you know, if you leak to a journalist, they will rat you out, they owe me a lot more than, than, than they owe you, um, you know, you will be tracked down. And as he was saying this to a group of people who'd worked, you know, sometimes 16 or 18 hour days, uh, sometimes longer, especially on elections for the Conservative Party and for their ministers, I mean, you're, you're talking to your friends here, Dominic, you're not talking to people who are against you. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of an esprit de corps, it wasn't, it wasn't fabulous. Um, the thing with Dominic Cummings, I found, was that he was an incredibly um, clear person in what he wanted. And that was actually really helpful um, to know what you wanted. For example, um, when the, uh, there was a terrorist attack in Streatham, which you may remember, where uh, a prisoner who recently got out of, I think, Belmarsh, 
um, was uh, atta attacked someone with a knife and was very, very quickly um, killed uh, by uh, MI5, by um, uh, anti-terrorist, uh, counter-terrorism officers. And I was in uh, the cabinet room actually, uh, speaking to the prime minister and uh, the home secretary was there, justice secretary, my boss at that stage, Robert Buckland uh, was there as were MI5 and various other people talking about this. And Boris Johnson sort of did the kind of chairman of the board, this is what I want the outcome to be. And then Dominic Cummings kind of took it on a granular level and said, right, who's doing this? Who's doing this? Who's doing this? What are we doing? How are we changing the legislation, for example, on this particular issue? And you always knew where you were with Dominic and you always knew exactly what he wanted. And actually in politics, which is full of quite vague people and sometimes what people in the Northern Ireland peace process used to call creative ambiguity, um, it was actually very useful to have someone who was very, very clear in what they wanted. You know, it was quite, it was definitely your own edge in meetings with him. You knew that, um, you know, he could strike at any point and someone might be sacked or something like that. It didn't happen very often, but it did occasionally happen. And he was quite an intimidating figure. There's no doubt about that. Um, but his power derived from Boris Johnson and Boris Johnson, I think often, when people are very critical of Dominic, which I'm not really, to be honest, um, I think a lot has been written about him that is uh, rightly critical, but, but most of it I disagree with. Um, I think they fail to remember that any special advisor's power derives directly from what we call their principle. So if Boris Johnson didn't want him in that role, he should not have allowed him to continue to. And of course, Dominic Cummings, I think there's some sort of curse in my book, actually, because um, I only really criticise three or four people. Um, I'm quite nice about most people. And uh, I criticised Lee Cain, who was the director of communications. He, he, had to, he would, sort of was forced to resign. Dominic Cummings, who was forced to resign. And... Um, uh, Piers Morgan, who uh, we all know what happened with him at uh, Good Morning Britain as well. So uh, maybe there's some sort of curse in the book. I don't know. Um, so we've got. Um, uh, thank you. And and actually, we. We'll, I don't want to leave Dominic Cummings as uh, uh, yet. But there are Cara Richardson saying yes, please. We need much more on DC and Nick and Fee as well. And Mark Lodge saying how in thrall is number ten to the West Wing idiom, and who is considered the hero. Toby, uh, Ziegler, John Lanham, uh, CJ or Leo? <laughs> um, Mark, I absolutely love uh, the West Wing. And in fact, as a 16 year old, I was doing four A-levels. They were all sort of quite essay based. And I didn't have much time to watch television. In fact, the only thing I really watched was Newsnight. But I remember there was a, on Sunday evenings, they did, um, they did, uh, um, uh, they did. Uh, they had the West Wing on, and then they had a, a Twenty Four on on BBC Two, and that was the, the one night that I that I watched. Um, in terms of the hero in the West Wing, um, I think, I mean, we all want to be Josh, but no one is Josh. And actually, uh, again, as I say in the book, I mean, Sean Buckland, who my my boss Robert Buckland, has this um, extremely uh, uh, strong-willed, uh, redoubtable wife, who's a great friend of mine, uh, Sean Buckland. And uh, there was one line in the book that she didn't, uh, she, she was very clear she didn't want in the book, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you now, which was um, Robert loved the, was the Lord Chancellor, was the Justice Secretary, and he loved all the, you know, the, 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 the wig and the silly clothes and all the pageantry. And, you know, he was the person who hands the, the Queen, the Queen's speech during the Queen's speech. And um, one line that was vetoed from the book was, uh, in that marriage, one of them wears the, the wig and the, and the tights and the other one wears the trousers. Uh, which was actually uh, John, John wasn't too keen on. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> no, uh, so Sean, uh, the point of saying this is that Sean had all sorts of West Wing nicknames for all the people around around Robert. And I was I was CJ because I was the press person, which is very clear that I was CJ, the press person, and not when CJ became chief of staff. So CJ, before she became chief of staff, I was, I was not to get ideas above my station. Uh, but um, I mean, I, my job, I think, was a sort of combination of Toby and CJ. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I think I think in terms of the uh, in number ten, I, I think that the West Wing. Well, actually, I saw Rishi Sunak's chief of staff, who's a very good friend of mine. Um, he was actually wearing a, a t-shirt at a party conference, Conservative Party conference in Manchester recently, and uh, it said uh, that the final election in uh, the West Wing is when uh, Matt Santos uh, runs and Leo McGarry is, uh, is is running as the, the, the vice president. He, he was running around writing this speech for Rishi Sunak with his Santos McGarry uh, t-shirt on. And I actually have a t-shirt which has, um, you know, Bartlett for America 1998, the fictional election there. So yeah, we're all, we're all huge fans of the West Wing, but um, 
I think probably not in thrall, certainly in thrall to the Americans, but of course there are so many special advisors in, in number 10 Downing Street now. You haven't seen the West Wing because it hasn't been on TV for sort of, I don't know, 11 or 12 years now. So they're all, they're all quite young and it's sort of passed them by. Um, but uh, I, I love all those. I, I think Yes Minister has sort of lost its, lost its thrall for many people. It's kind of almost a generational thing. Whereas I think um, West Wing, yeah, absolutely. on the thick of it as well. I mean, there, there are so many times, I remember there was once when I was in government, when someone came up with a really stupid idea, um, which was for James Broken Chart to put it, send out a tweet to congratulate a Labour mayor for winning an election, because uh, we were the party of we were the uh, department for local government, and this was a local government election. So obviously, a civil servant thought he should put out this tweet, and I said, you know, we've just had tens of thousands of uh, volunteers for the Conservative Party knocking doors in the wind and the rain. Um, you know, probably hundreds, if not thousands, of them in that particular constituency. Are you then saying that we should put out this? tweet I mean they just hadn't considered it at all and I used a line from the the thick of it and said whoever came up with this idea is so dense light bends around them uh, which is a is a Malcolm Tucker line uh, so I was sort of the pound shop pound shop Malcolm Tucker on that occasion but hopefully not on too many other occasions and hopefully treated people in a reasonable way um, in terms of more on Nick and Fee I mean I always thought they were they were definitely I mean uh, there was, a, there was a, a nice review, but nonetheless a review of, of my uh, book that was written by a woman called Polly McKenzie, who was Nick Clegg's uh, chief policy advisor. She was in Downing Street, in 10 Downing Street, actually. She had an office there and was uh, one of Nick Clegg's very senior people. And she said I was far too nice to them. And, uh, you know, she had dealt with people who were uh, really, really tricky and difficult um, and find them very uh, political and, and, you know, with small p and very, sort of briefing against people and leaking things and all the rest of it. And sometimes that's just politics. Sometimes that's the way it is. But I was lucky in that um, James Brokenshire, who I worked for most of the time, I was, I mean, I was in government for about three and a half years and I worked for James for nearly three of those years um, and then three other ministers for, for, mm -hmm. for much shorter periods of time. I mean, James made it very clear, you know, don't leak things, don't brief against people, don't be nasty, be nice. Um, and that was fine. And maybe if I'd had other ministers who had asked me to, to do things that weren't ethical, maybe I would have done those. There are certainly special advisors who do, do things that aren't uh, things that I would feel comfortable with. But um, I was lucky in that I worked for four people who have very high ethical and moral standards and were great politicians, um, especially James and, and Robert as well. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, I don't know how I would have acted had I been in Downing Street. I never worked at number 10. Um, and sometimes people are forced into positions that are very, very difficult. And politics is the art of the possible. Sometimes it's a matter of doing things that are, you know, perhaps not what you would want. You know, you would not want sometimes your boss. Sometimes, you know, I know special advisors keep things from their boss. Sometimes they use people talk about the dark arts and so on. And Dominic definitely used the dark arts. Nick and Fee definitely used the dark arts. I probably did on from time to time as well but I'll let others sort of judge on that so it's a very very difficult um it's a very very difficult job and sometimes you know what is success in a special advisor I mean there's some special advisors who are absolutely brilliant but they've got terrible ministers you know there are some media I was the media special advisor and I was lucky in that everybody I worked for was pretty good in the media uh, but I know some people who are really really good media people who are excellent PR people but their minister is terrible in the media uh, for example, or the other way around, and there are some special advisors who are there because they make the they make their principal feel good about themselves. You know, they're they're perhaps not the most skilled people, and this is the weirdest thing. I mean, you can essentially be appointed for all sorts of different reasons, and it is slightly about who you know. Dominic tried to change that actually; he tried to do it a bit more on merit, and created a whole system for uh, people to go through. But I'm not sure if if that was ever if that was ever fully used. Uh, talking about Dominic, just one last question that's come in. Um, uh, do you see him ever coming back in a very powerful position in government? No, absolutely not. I think it's chief of staff is, or, or you know, he, he basically wasn't that role. He wasn't that entitled. But um, I mean, it's sort of the last job you do. Um, it's very difficult to do. I, think, I mean, we've seen we've seen a few. Uh, obviously, Gavin Barwell is now in the Lords, for example. He may be a minister at some stage. I, I don't see that. I think he'll probably, you know, he has lots of advisory roles and, and goes off and does that. Um, but um, he, uh, I, you know, it, it is rare for um, someone who is uh, a, a chief of staff or a senior senior special advisor. I don't, I can't, I think Dominic Cummings has just burned too many bridges. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think he's, you know, that interview you gave to Lord Coonsberg was an extraordinary piece of television. Um, and, you know, she asked him brilliant questions. She did really, really well. Uh, but but what an odd piece of television. Um, and I think a lot of people 
were actually a little bit disturbed at how much power he had. I didn't quite realize some of the some of the, the influence he had and some of the behind the scenes machinations that I wasn't party to, of course, in terms of you know thoughts about removing Boris Johnson and things like that, which would you know pretty anti-democratic if you ask me. Uh, we've got a question from Joseph McMahon saying, where do you acquire the expertise to be a special advisor? Why do you know so much more than your principal? Um, just the second part of that, I don't think you necessarily know more than your principal. I think that you have access to different, um, I mean, you, you, you have different skill set, first of all. And the best special advisor partnerships are ones where you have complementary uh, skill sets. So James Brogenshaw, for example, brilliant details man, you know, read every single piece of paper that was ever put in front of him in a way that no other minister in government I know, uh, they may have read them, but they didn't absorb them in the way that, that James did. Incredible lawyer's brain, you know, he was 31, he was a, at 31 years old, he was a partner in Jones Day, you know, huge law firm, he could have gone on to earn um, probably over a million pounds a year, um, he, he didn't, he, he turned his back on that for a lifetime of public service. I am not a details person at all, uh, I have a crap memory um, and, uh, you know, I, I can't remember complex things that I'm not particularly interested in, which probably led to my double B in, in, in uh, GCSE science. Um, so um, I think that, you know, but I am I'm very good at seeing the big picture. I'm very good at twisting people's arms. I'm getting good media coverage. I'm making sure, you know, James did the right interviews and that he was briefed properly for those interviews and that he had access to the right information that he needed. Um, so we, we, I knew lots of things about the media that he didn't know. I knew a lot of things, a lot of people in the media. I knew how the media worked in a way that he didn't, although he took quite a lot of interest in it. Um, I, I knew, you know, which journalist to give an exclusive to because in three weeks' time we want them to write something nice about us, uh, which you know someone else probably won't write. Um, but we we need that in, a, a, you know, keeping. Um, it's a difficult game in terms of media because you want to feed the beast, as it were, but also. Uh, you need to keep everybody happy and also you know how to have a difficult conversation with the journalist where they're going to write something bad that's going to be bad for you but you you make it as 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 as, as good as it can be uh, whereas some ministers are quite not james actually but some ministers are quite hot-headed and think why does this journalist hate me you know that's rarely the case um whereas James, for example, knew politics in a way that I didn't. I was a journalist for 10 years. I worked for Newsnight, I worked for Question Time. Um, I worked for Sky News as a political news editor. Um, I knew quite a lot about politics, not very much about policy, really. Um, and I learned a heck of a lot going into government and, and that, that has stood me in, in really, really good stead. And, and actually, just in the last few weeks, actually, since we spoke properly, Ada, I've actually been made the political editor of, of, of Talk Radio. So that's kind of my new my new job alongside a couple of other things. So um, congratulations, Peter, and uh, really uh, fantastic news. And um, and actually, I want to make sure there's a bit of time for us to talk about you and talk radio and your plans. I just want to bring up uh, Cara Richardson, who says um, uh, that she thought your tribute to James Rockenshire uh, on the day the news of his passing broke was very beautiful on Times Radio. So that was just a nice thing to say. Now, I'm going to move on. I'm going to read you a little little quote, can't remember who it's by, but you can tell us, shadowy geniuses whispering Rasputin-like into the ears of our elected politicians under a cloak of secrecy. Um, and uh, as a definition of the spads. Um, and I want you to just, just tell us your story. How, how did you end up in this role? And then we're going to move on and talk about Piers Morgan and Jeremy Paxman after that. So okay. uh, just Cool. Well, first of all, Cara, thank you very much for your very kind words there. Um, it's funny, actually, I was, um, when James died, I've been in a lot of touch with his family. I've been helping arrange a few things in regard to his funeral tomorrow. And uh, yeah, um, it, was, it was, I was actually standing in his garden, believe it or not, in the garden of his house, uh, doing that interview with Times Radio and Kathy Newman did a, did a great job. Um, so thank you for your, for your very nice comments there. Um, in terms of, you know, are they shadowy geniuses whispering, whispering Rasputin like into the ears of, uh, of government ministers? I think sometimes they are, um, probably. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you're pulling the levers behind the scenes and actually the, the, the design of, of, of my book, I don't know if I mentioned I wrote a book, um, and uh, soon to mention every answer, sorry about that, um, is, is always like a sort of puppeteer uh, in, in, the, in the brain of, of, a, of, a, of a minister. And sometimes it's like that and sometimes it's like that. I mean, different, different special advisors have, have different sort of levels of influence. But um, in terms of becoming a special advisor, uh, I, it was always something I was interested in. I mean, I, I was a journalist. Uh, I was sort of 
loved writing, loved uh, broadcasting. Uh, anytime I got the opportunity to do so, um, occasionally at school, I wrote quite a lot for my local newspaper. I wrote a column for a newspaper in Belfast and would write quite a lot, especially on education issues from time to time for various newspapers. And then I got really into journalism as well, student journalism at Oxford and worked with a number of people who've actually become um, professional journalists. In fact, uh, a lot of people at Sky News, believe it or not, there are, I think, three uh, political correspondents, Tom Rayner, Tamara Cohen, and uh, Sophie Ridge, who, who usually, she's off on maternity leave at the moment, but she usually presents the, the Sunday morning uh, program, discussion program, we're all contemporaries of mine. Um, at Oxford, we all worked in the same student newspaper and various people in, in, in print as well. Um, Helen Lewis as well, who, who's a sort of quite well-known left-wing uh, commentator. She used to be deputy editor of the New Statesman. She's now at the Atlantic. You'd see her on sort of Politics Live and she's been on Question Time and, and things like that. So Helen's a very good friend as well. So um, part of, I was always interested in politics. I always wanted to cover political journalism. And part of my job at Newsnight uh, was to be, at, for about a year, was to be this sort of almost, almost uh, uh, sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of character where you would go for lunch with MPs. I was based in, in, in the, the BBC Westminster office, right just across the road from Parliament. I would go and have lunch and things with MPs and then say, oh yes, no, you must come on uh, Newsnight and you know, it'll be fine. Oh, Paxman, yes, he's quite tough, but if you can survive that, you can survive anything. Quite a lot of up and coming MPs I got to know, especially after the 2010, election. I got to know um, various people like Stella Creasy, who's a really, really, um, a really interesting person, Rachel Reeves, obviously now Shadow Chancellor, um, and uh, Sarah Wollaston, of course, many people on this call will know uh, with her health background. Uh, Matt Hancock as well is actually someone I got to know quite well, um, who were all at that stage, uh, sort of 10 years ago, all these kind of up and coming, quite thrusting people who wanted to get on, get on the television, uh, as well as the ministers and, and the special advisors and all the rest of it. And some special advisors were really annoying. Um, some of them you would ring and say, you know, I'd ring them at sort of 11 o'clock in the morning after our morning meeting at Newsnight and say, you know, will will the Secretary of State come on to Newsnight this evening? Um, and they would say, we'll get back to you. And then they sort of string you along and you'd be trying to get the programme together. It'd be really difficult. You'd be trying to get briefing together for Jeremy Paxman or Kirsty Walker, whoever was presenting that evening. Um, and you still wouldn't know who the guest was and whether they would do it or whether they wouldn't. And sometimes it was sort of 7, 7.30 at night before you even knew what the lineup on Newsnight was, which is very, very difficult, especially when you're trying to plan, when you're doing the sort of Mr. Hyde aspect of the scenario and you're coming up with the really, really horrible questions for, 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 for Jeremy Paxman to, uh, to ask, which was part of the creative, creative process. And he had people like me to, to come up with those questions, um, as well as his own you know, vast, vast brain um, to, to do those as well. Um, but one person who I got on with very well, who was the special advisor at the Home Office, was the aforementioned Fiona Hill. And a lot of people didn't like Fiona. A lot of people found her very, very difficult. A lot of people found her very abrasive. Um, some people even find her quite abusive. And a lot has been written about her that is not very kind. Um, and in fact, as I say in the book, when I, was at, when I was at the Home Office, I was only a special advisor at the Home Office for a short time under Amber Rudd, when she was Home Secretary, uh, someone asked me this question, how did you get into special advising? And I said it was Fiona Hill who, who brought me in. And uh, she, you know, was very nice, but always be very grateful to her. And uh, the civil servant said, well, you know, congratulations, you're one of the, you're part of the 1%. And I said, what do you mean the 1%? She said, the 1% of people who have anything nice to say about Fiona Hill, uh, which I thought was, was pretty harsh, but, uh, but, but interesting nonetheless. Um, so Fiona was an interesting person who I was in touch with a lot as a journalist. Um, she, as I said, then got sacked. She, we stayed in touch a bit. I wouldn't say we were close friends or anything, but I, I have a policy of, you know, not dropping people and staying friends with people, even if they're in tough times. And uh, then she came back in a blaze of glory. She was running Mrs. May's leadership campaign, and then she became her chief of staff. And uh, I thought, do you know what? I will send her my CV and I'll see if there are any openings. I just, I'd been a journalist for 10 years. At that stage, I was working at Good Morning Britain with Piers Morgan. as I was a reporter there. And uh, I mean, this very, very short series of emails. I mean, Fiona was chief of staff and she had very, very little time, I'm sure. But literally, I sent my CV and said, if there are any, any openings, I'd be interested in having a conversation. And she got back to me within about 24 hours with an email quite simply saying, would you consider NI SPAN? So NIO, Northern Ireland office. And then I was thrust together with James Brokenshire and uh, literally sent the email, I think, on a Wednesday, got a reply on the Thursday, met James on the Saturday. And then he offered me the job on the Saturday night. 
um, at a meeting with the permanent secretary, the most senior civil servant at the Northern Ireland office. So it was all signed, sealed, delivered, but I just had a chat to him on the Monday morning. Uh, and then I got my Downing Street approval through from Fiona. Um, and literally, you know, within a week I'd resigned. Um, I was working out my notice and they wanted me as soon as possible. And Good Morning Britain were very good and let me go kind of a bit early. Uh, which was nice and um yeah then i started working at the northern ireland office yeah so, so it yeah. was a, it was a whirlwind whirlwind yeah. in a yeah, good yeah. way in a good way despite yes. the various job losses and new appointments and you know yes every, every reshuffle that. yeah james james, every resigned reshuffle. And james resigned abra rudd had to resign because of wind yeah. rush um yeah it just kind of went on and on but yeah i think i lost, yeah. technically lost my job by three or four times but that that's that's the way these things work part of the job. Now, um, a couple of words or anecdotes uh, on both Piers Morgan and Jeremy Paxman, and then I'm going to go, I'm going to ask you something completely different. Okay, so um, Piers Morgan, uh, I always found actually okay uh, to work with. Um, he was he was all right. Um, I think a lot of his stuff on TV was probably more of a persona, but uh, what was quite interesting was having having worked with him, was um, that on one occasion uh, he uh, had been very, very critical of Mrs. May um, and you know he'd every, every right to be, but the point of, of journalism in this country is that people are certainly on Good Morning Britain are meant to be impartial uh, in terms of asking questions. And he had made it very, very clear that he thought you know Brexit was a total disaster, Theresa May was a terrible leader, et cetera, which went, I thought, beyond what was sort of reasonable comment. Um, and I sent an email, which I, I'm still very happy to this day, about to the editor of uh, Good Morning Britain, who was asking for James to come on. At that stage, James was housing secretary. And I said, you know, I don't think we can rely on Piers to do an impartial interview. So, you know, I'm not going to not going to do this interview tomorrow morning. Um, Downing Street were very happy with that email. I see, you know, CC, the head of broadcasting. And uh, then the next thing I knew, uh, the next morning, we were doing all sorts of other interviews for other breakfast programs, but not for Good Morning Britain. Uh, Piers Morgan read out the email and uh, said all sorts of things about I was a terrible person and James was a terrible person and he should sack me and, you know, um, that this was terrible and I wanted it to be North Korea and, uh, you know, I didn't believe in freedom of speech and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, what wasn't great, not, 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 not a great way to start the day, but actually it enhanced my reputation uh, with Downing Street. Uh, James was perfectly happy and the director of communications at Downing Street actually rang me, uh, a guy called Robbie Gibb, now Sir Robbie Gibb, who rang me and said, you know, good on you, mate. And uh, I was in Robbie's office um, a bit later that day for another meeting actually in Downing Street. And he said, uh, he was going to make a complaint and I said by all means you know talk to the editor of Good Morning Britain and uh, he, he sort of looked over my shoulder to his secretary and said get me the chairman of ITV on the phone um so that was that was a slightly strange <laughs> uh, slightly strange experience um yeah. with, Jer with Jeremy Paxman I mean I have the utmost respect for Jeremy um I wouldn't say we're friends but we, we're, we're certainly on, on friendly terms I generally see him once or twice a year uh we'll occasionally go for lunch or um we will see each other at a book launch or something like that. Um, he's someone who I have the greatest respect for as a journalist. And uh, I mean, he's been very, very good to me when my grandfather was ill, for example, in the last days of his life, he said, he, he took me aside and said, I think you told me one time your grandfather was a big fan of Newsnight. I said, yeah, he said, I'd like you to maybe give him this letter. He'd written him a lovely letter, you know, very proud of your grandson, you know, work, works very well. Couldn't do, couldn't do my job without him, you know, load of nonsense, but uh, a nice thing anyway for Grandor to receive. And just, I just, you know, just behind the scenes, just a very, very nice person, but um, an yeah. interesting, interesting character as well. And ne never a dull moment with Jeremy. But I think, I think the nicest moment working with Jeremy actually was um, when I worked at BBC Washington for Newsnight. Um, on the, it was the the night before Barack Obama was elected, wow. and we were at a, a rally in a place called Manassas in um, in Virginia. And I was sitting on this sort of big platform that they put all the all the um, the 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 uh, cameras on and Barack Obama was talking and was giving you know brilliant speech um and I was sitting beside Jeremy Paxman you know 100 yards from from Barack Obama in this absolutely still night in this kind of stadium uh, a baseball stadium which was packed with people and I just thought you know there there, there are worse ways to earn a living uh, <laughs> oh thank you for sharing that um so you you you've interviewed a lot of politicians you've worked for politicians now you're going to be launching this other new career and you're going to be surrounded by power does power corrupt peter uh yes it does um and i think that the worst thing that power does is that it, it means you lose perspective um and i think that what is i mean theresa may made a really good point in parliament today when she was talking about james roganshaw and she said that 
you know, is a really good constituency MP. And I think that the moment you forget that you're there because of your constituents and you're there because of the voters, it's not about you. It's often about your party rather than you as a person. Um, and also you're there by consent uh, in the democratic process. And I think a lot of people forget both elected people and unelected people. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, oh, Spads are unelected and they have so much power. And well, yes, but also, you know, they're, um, Chris Whitty is, is unelected. Um, I mean, I, I, I think he's great. Um, you know, and I'm really glad he's the, he's the chief medical officer, but I also, uh, you know, he is unelected. Um, as are many, you know, judges and, and civic leaders in many other, other ways. So it's something I'm, I'm much more relaxed about, but I do think that um, power can corrupt uh, not all the time, but uh, sometimes it does. And I think the moment you forget that actually, um, you know, you're there by consent. And I think that some of the some of the fun stuff that I got to do, I mean, I remember being in a sort of RAF flight between Belfast and London and, you know, drinking a gin and tonic out of these sort of cut glass um, kind of uh, tumblers and having these canapes and smoked salmon and all the rest of it as they sort of RAF uniformed officers were on the plane, mm -hmm. which was sort of, you know, an RAF plane going into Bryce Norton. And I just sort of thought, I mean, this is lovely. This is great. But could I look sort of a taxpayer who, you know, knocks their pan in for 40 hours a week to pay their taxes, which are funding this flight? You know, could I look a taxpayer in the eye and say that this is a good use of money? I mean, I needed to be on that plane. I needed to be at that, you know, in Belfast for that meeting at that time. Um, and we couldn't have flown commercially on that occasion as we usually did. Um, but but was that was that something I felt overall comfortable with um, i mean i felt very comfortable because the plane was very comfortable but you know in in the, in the essence of, 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 of uh, sort of figuratively speaking and i mean i think you just need to be really aware of the fact that you're there because because the public vote your boss in there for you work for your boss you know where where the power kind of derives from and the moment you lose sight of that then you're 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 in trouble do you think that um if we just stick to political power for a moment, do you feel that there are some shared common traits in the people who have in recent years uh, climbed that ladder of power? Um, and I'll get on to hubris later, but just for a moment, when you look around you and you see who's up there right now, are there things that you notice you, you, you got close to them, closer than mm. most of the people tonight? Um, yes, I mean, I think I think there are some lazy comparisons. The, the, the comparison I find between very powerful political figures I find mo laziest is the kind of, you know, is Boris or Trump, basically. You know, he is not. Uh, Trump is, is a completely, hopefully a complete one-off in so many ways. Um, you know, Boris is a very, very different character and is in power for very, very different reasons um, than Trump was in power. And I find that comparison quite lazy. It's interesting that there's, there often seems to be a pendulum in terms of what the public wants. You know, Margaret Thatcher was a very, very charismatic character. Um, everybody had an opinion on how she operated and on her way of doing things. Then we went for a sort of the grey man in, in John Major. Then he went for the charismatic Tony Blair. And so on, it goes sort of backwards and forwards. And I wonder if that actually plays to Sir Keir Starmer's strengths in that, um, you know, I, I felt a lot of... Um, at, uh, I was for talk radio, I was in Brighton for, for Labour Party conference. And I thought that Keir Starmer always seemed slightly embarrassed about the fact that he is an incredible, you know, an incredibly intelligent, interesting person who has prosecuted, you know, dreadful murderers and terrorists and all the rest of it, not only as a lawyer, but, but latterly as, as director of public prosecutions within that role. So I do kind of wonder, um, you know, why not own that a bit more? Why not stop talking about what is quite a boring backstory actually about well I had a, I had two parents and they had jobs well great that's usually what happens uh, for most people so um why not just own the fact that you're actually a little bit you know you're a very intelligent man who has done very interesting and important things the bit of his speech for example where he talked about the Stephen Lawrence murder and, and prosecuting those people I find much more interesting than anything to do with his backstory uh, although he did speak very movingly about his mother's illness um so in terms of what the public want I think it's a, it's a strange thing because it's, it's strange because the public doesn't really know what it wants. Um, the public thinks, you know, we, we, we find these people who we go through stages with. Tony Blair is the best example where people were really charmed by him. 
thought he was very, very different to the, you know, the bad old Tories, 18 years of Tory rule and, you know, same old Tories and all the kind of rhetoric. Um, and then they realised, actually, this guy is not reliable and this is someone who is a bit of a shyster. And I think the public seemed to, you know, the media, the media's got his role to play as well. We absolutely build people up. We knock them down. And I think that the coarsening of political debate that I've seen in my lifetime and my sort of almost political lifetime, really, my adult life anyway, is quite interesting because we want, you know, we want politicians to be honest with us, yet when they change their mind or it's a U-turn, you know, it's a dreadful thing. So I think there are common characteristics in a lot of leaders, but also the common thing that, you know, you cannot be all things to all men and women. And real leadership is going beyond and saying, you might disagree with me, but let me convince you, let me persuade you. And I think that feeds into all sorts of political arguments and actually feeds into the argument about the vaccine as well. You know, there is undeniable scientific proof that the vaccine is a good thing and works. With talk radio, for example, there are a lot of people who listen and I present programs from time to time. I'm presenting a program on, on Saturday. There are people who do not believe the vaccine works, who believe that it is a conspiracy, that uh, you know we're injecting 5G into people's arms and that they, they will not be told by the government or the medical profession what to do. If we shout at those people and if we say, you're an idiot, here's the science, you're stupid, they're not going to get it. You need to persuade them. And I'd love more politicians to be persuasive rather than simply hectoring and to lead in that way. And I think that's, I mean, sorry, I've gone off on a slight, slight, no, 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 I've gone off on a slight tangent about what I want out of leadership, but I think. Yeah, that, yeah, I, 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 thank you. You haven't gone on too much at all. Now, uh, but now I've got a couple more questions and we're going to keep them brief because then there's also uh, people listening with some questions and I'm aware we're coming to the last 10 minutes of tonight. But Hubris says arrogance and excessive pride. Do you have an example, let's say in the last three years, anything that you, you know, the biggest example of hubris that you may have come across um you may not don't feel under any pressure but i can't really think of an example i'm afraid just not off the top of my head anyway no. I'm, yeah. sure there, I'm sure there are many examples of politics and <laughs> no, no, that's that's absolutely fine um and then another question i i, I wanted to ask you i've had we were discussing it earlier um is being a politician nowadays a dangerous pr profession, in your opinion? And I'm not just referring to the recent mm. tragedy, but in general. Um, yes, it is a dangerous profession. I think everybody has an opinion on every single thing you say and do. Um, I think those opinions can get to you very quickly, uh, whether it is the myriad of ways that people contact their politicians. Um, I think that it is very, very um dangerous in terms i mean even if you look at let's let's cast aside the david amos thing which a lot of people have been have talked about and you know you don't need me to give my opinion on it you know you know what you think and you know it's a dreadful tragedy and a terrible thing but there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes um there are politicians i know who've had death threats there are politicians i've known who, who, who you know this won't ever be public but there are people whose you know children have been have been threatened um i mean we need to find a way to disagree without being disagreeable um, and to, to have a debate about all sorts of things rather than necessarily just saying you're, you're wrong and are therefore a terrible person. And I feel that social media has enhanced that. I think the accessibility of politicians through, even through email. Um, I mean, there are lovely people who work behind the scenes for politicians. There's a woman I know who's worked for uh, Dr. Fox, Liam Fox, for years and years and years and years. And she told me that, you know, the vitriol on the answer phone, the vitriol through email, social media, it's worse now than it ever has been. I think we're a very divided society. I think that we, you know, there are a lot of arguments that are pretty reductive. Um, you can make that point certainly about Brexit if you want to, uh, in terms of how divided the country was, you know, certainly the, the divisive issue that I've ever come across in my political lifetime. And, you know, you can make arguments about who weaponized that and how this, that was dealt with and behaviors on, 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 on all sides of that argument. Um, but yes, politi uh, politics is dangerous. Um, it's very high risk, just in general, it's very high risk to become a paid politician, to become an MP, you require huge sacrifices. And I think if we keep being horrible about our politicians, and if we keep saying they're dreadful people who are on the make, and they're shysters, and they're dreadful human beings, and then good people don't go into politics, well, maybe they're connected in some way. Um, maybe we should be encouraging more people in, and maybe we should be getting people from all parts of you know, the professions and, and, and none, um, you know, 
the, 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 the sort of democracy, the democratic nature of people who go into politics is not very democratic. It's very self-selecting. It's very expensive, for example, to go around lots of selections and, and to persuade people to make you the candidate. Um, you're out of pocket and can't really have a job for at least a year in, any, in most constituencies, unless it's a very, very safe seat. Um, it is a very expensive, very time consuming, very difficult thing to do to become an MP. Um, and then if our starting position is that person being an MP is, you know, a bad person, well, then we're not going to get the right people to run our country. And in some ways, we, we, we sometimes get the politicians we deserve. Um, and I just hope that there are more, more of them that are, are good and good people as time goes on and can follow the example of some of the politicians I work with rather than mm -hmm. uh, ones who aren't. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your sense of identity. Right now, are you more of an author or a politician or a journalist? I think I'm probably more of a journalist. Um, I mean, the book is, is done, uh, it's written. Um, politics is, is, is over for me, um, at least for the meantime. Um, and I think, you know, to give my listeners and, and viewers and so on the best uh, service, I need to be critical of the government. I need to say what is the case in, in my analysis and opinion, uh, which is what talk radio want me to do. I'm presenting some programs for them, uh, two, two programs this weekend, for example. And I think I need to be um, very honest about what I think. I think, you know, when you're on the inside and when you're, you're kind of in the bunker, as it were, you become very black and white about, you know, we're the good guys and everybody else are the bad guys. And you can't be like that. And actually, I tried as much as possible not to be like that. And I think my journalistic background uh, for such a long time, seeing all sides of the argument, um, because I had to for my job, um, was helpful. And I was certainly a lot less tribal than some people who, you know, had only ever worked in politics, for example. But I, I think, you know, the thing is that you're very similar. I mean, I had a lot more in common with a Labour advisor than I did someone who hated all politicians, for example. And I think that most people I encountered in politics of all political parties, of all persuasions, and I would actually include um, people I, you know, fundamentally disagreed with within that, uh, within that, uh, the, within the auspices of that. Uh, most people go in to make the world a better place. Ninety-five percent of people I worked with were great people. Yes, they often had flaws. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that I'm sure I had many flaws, but essentially you're, you're there for the right reasons. And I think we need to remember that a bit more. Excellent. I've got two questions to finish with. Uh, one is from Ta Hilton. Interesting comparison with Chris Whitty, who was no doubt required to meet professional criteria for a specified job description and be assessed objectively against other candidates of similar qualifications and skills. Uh, where are SPAD roles advertised and who ensures best candidates are recruited? You can give a one minute answer. Don't go on too much. I don't want to run over time, but it is an interesting question. Absolutely. And you're, you're absolutely correct um, that I'm sure, uh, Professor Whitty, I'm sure those uh, criteria were absolutely met. I suppose the point I was making in terms of Chris Whitty, uh, who I have the utmost respect for, uh, are quite simply that, um, you know, he is unelected. Uh, that was that was the only point I was making that, you know, many leaders in, in society, I wasn't saying it was a bad thing, I'm just saying many leaders in society are, are, are unelected. Um, I mean, SPAD rules are not advertised. Uh, there is no real process to, to, to ensure the best candidates are recruited. Uh, sometimes, you know, a lot of it is patronage. Uh, I knew Fiona Hill, that's how I got in. Um, you could say I was either very well qualified because I knew the Northern Ireland media and the London media and knew Northern Ireland politics very, very well. Uh, or you could say I was terribly badly underqualified for it because I went into the Ministry of Housing not knowing very much about housing, for example. Uh, but that's not the nature of spatting, and it is a very weird job with a very weird job description, which doesn't even really exist, and it's kind of what you make it anyway. So it's a great question, and there is no no particularly good answer. Um, and I think that you know there are a lot of people uh, to formalize. The more it was formalized, I think the more difficult it would be to get the right people for the jobs because there is a strange set of skills and often ministers want different things from different special advisors and it has to be, the key element is trust. The key element Thank is you. trust. Thank you, Peter. Paul Dinsdale, how do SPADs get on with civil servants given that there must be plenty of scope for friction and disagreement? There's lots of friction, there's lots of disagreement, um, but at the same time, the vast majority of civil servants I worked with were excellent people. Uh, some of them were, you know, a very, very small number, but they did exist had their own agendas. Um, one in particular, I uh, became a, a sworn enemy of, um, but uh, most people were great. Uh, most people did the job they were meant to do. 
and um, you know there, there is friction because essentially there's, there's sort of let's let's talk let's talk to some scientists um, a Venn diagram between what the politician wants, uh, what the civil service wants, um, and then the little bit in the middle that you you, know, you as a special advisor kind of negotiate every single day. So you know I would sit in meetings where the chief the chief finance officer, for example, of the department would say, well. Um, this is this is an interesting idea, but we're going to have severe financial problems if we implement this policy in four year, four and a half years time. And I would say, well, that's all very well, but I don't care because I won't be here in four and a half years time. Um, there'll have been another election. Uh, there may be a different government and I won't be in this job. And my my focus, my laser like focus is on the guy I work for or the woman I work for. And I want there to be, you know, this is why I want this policy. And, you, you know, that's that's an extreme example, but you negotiate that space all the time. Uh, we've got one last, uh, just a contribution from Dr. Adi saying that he read that Tory politicians' families uh, tend to be particularly victimised with intimidation, etc. in public. Uh, you don't need to re respond to that uh, unless you've got anything to say, but it's just one of the things. Just, just to say that I actually think that, um, I mean, I, I don't know in terms of, you know, Conservative versus Labour, and there's so much that is unseen. Uh, obviously, we, we've seen uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg's uh, son, Peter, being, being victimised. But, you know, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes of all sorts of politicians from all parties. And just because we've seen that on the media doesn't mean there's not a lot more uh, behind the scenes. I think it's very difficult to be the child of a politician. And in fact, there's a brilliant chapter in Jeremy Paxman's book, The Political Animal, about this. And I know that my own publisher, Bike Back, is in fact thinking about publishing a book on politicians' families, which I think is long overdue. Oh, great. I'm gl very glad to hear that and that to, to have this as your last contribution to the interview. Peter, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure and thank you to the audience for uh, such stimulating questions. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to move on now and say, uh, first of all, uh, please don't forget, uh, you will get a feedback form. You can uh, contribute to that. You can donate. Uh, both to um, the uh, specific charity for lung cancer that Peter was talking about, we'll have that up here. Uh, and, also, and also remember the Royal Society of Medicine does these events for free. Uh, educationally, we want to continue doing so and uh, please do support us. Uh, there's a QR code uh, that you will see um, and also on our website you can contribute. So two, two different uh, contributions uh, tonight if you can. Um, now now I'll move on to the events. So, uh, uh, and stay there, Peter, for a moment. So, Richard Sykes next Wednesday. Uh, we should here we are. You can see it coming up. Um, Jeremy Hunt on Thursday, and uh, Professor David Spiegelhalter, who is going to give the Dan Gore lecture uh, on COVID stats on Tuesday. So, pretty much unmissable, all three of them. And uh, I'd like to close tonight by saying thank you very much also to the tech support. Uh, very, very helpful. And um, uh, thanking uh, Peter again and good night and wish you well with your new role. Thank you very much indeed. Bye Thanks bye. for listening to me. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.